You bring your phone everywhere. Work, school, shh, the movies. Now you can bring it to an Xfinity store for an easy way to switch to Xfinity Mobile, a new kind of network designed to save you money. You can get up to five lines of talk and text included with Xfinity Internet at no extra cost, so all you pay for is data. It's never been easier to switch to Xfinity Mobile and keep the phone you love. Click here to see how. Sorry, I gotta take this. Restrictions apply. Limited to select mobile phones. Requires activation of a new line of Xfinity Mobile. Up to five devices per account. New Xfinity Internet customers limited to up to two lines pending activation of Internet service. Archangels, ghosts, and Bigfoot. Oh my. It's just another night for Supernatural Girls. Real stories, real answers to life's biggest supernatural mysteries. And now for another exciting interview with paranormal experts from this world and others. Here's your host, paranormal researcher Patricia Baker, on the one, the only, Supernatural Girls. Welcome, everyone, to another exciting episode of Supernatural Girls Radio. I'm your host, Patricia Baker. I am here with my co-host, Patricia Kirkman, PK. And you're back in Tucson tonight. I know it. I miss you. I miss your food. I miss you more, but I miss your food, too. (laughs) (laughs) Well, didn't we have a great time with you out here? Oh, we did. It was wonderful. It was so great. And we just, it's hard to say goodbye, but I wanted to make your stay as comfortable as possible. And that's why we imported those two pound lobsters for everybody. And so I forced myself <laughs> to eat them. It was, it was such a chore. And of course the wine wasn't bad either. No, no the wine was good. The wine was good. It was, it was a wonderful time. Spoiled rotten. And I loved every minute of it. <laughs> Well, good. We want you out here more often. We'll spoil you more often. How's that? Okay. Is that well, I'm deal or about it now. Sounds good. Okay. Sounds good. That was a lot of fun having you here. So we've got so much to talk about. We have an incredible guest tonight. Yes, we do. I'm going to warn you guys, this book, it's called Physicians Untold Stories. It is by Dr. Scott J. Kolbaba. He is an amazing writer, and he has stories here. I had to get my Kleenex out. I really did. It, yeah, they are did. all amazing, moving stories, doctors touched by the divine and willing to talk about it, willing to share it with us. We're going to bring him on in a few minutes. So get ready. It's going to be a great show, and you're going to learn a lot about how doctors embody this, how they reach out, and how they share their experiences with the spirit. So it's it's just amazing stuff, isn't it? Oh, absolutely fabulous. It was it held your attention. It's like, it was like watching everything going so fast and you got, oh got a quick let me catch that one. What did I miss? And then go back to the next one. They were all oh, the book is fabulous. It is so well done. And mm-hmm. again, I can't wait to get Dr. Kolbaba on the show. So, but first, we got to check in with the numbers. What in the world's going on? We got retrograde. On well, again, that's about it. The retrograde's it. the key to, to pay attention to right now. Uh, let's face it, as we all know, this month represents everybody last year. Whatever happened last year, you're getting an opportunity to tidy it up, put it together, and get rid of what you can. But right now, we went into retrograde as of the 13th, and we will be in retrograde until September 5th. So, unless you're born in a retrograde, we're fair game for electronics breaking down, messages to be transposed, things lost. It is chaotic. Do under no circumstance anything that's legal that has to be put together for the long haul because it's all going to change. Mm. It'll so, have to be redone, right? It That is definitely a case where it'll be redone. And don't throw your electronics away that isn't working right now. Put it on the shelf. Try it afterwards. You might be surprised. It may work again. Well, that's the good part yes. of it. Yes. Well, that's the best part of it. But yeah. it's difficult because everyone wants it to be just right. The harder we try to make it perfect, the more we mess up everything. It's just not... 
cars, if we take a look at everything's computer generated, our cars today. I've had three people call me today, and I've only been back since last night. They're having problems with uh, their printer, with their cars starting because there's a computer chip. So right. there we go again. Yes. So everybody's going to have to take a deep breath over the next few weeks until this is over. So here we go. Right. That's for sure. Yes. Now we've got some news about Tucson, of all places, where yes. you are. I'm and checking it's not my, good. No, I'm checking my fingers. <laughs> they have found fleas with the bubonic plague mm -hmm. in Tucson. This is not good. No, it so, is not. No, so we want to stay away from fleas in Tucson, right? To stay healthy. That's stay the scary away from thing. a lot of things. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it, it, it's scary because what's that story? Everything old is new again. Yeah. This is not one of those things that you want to be new again. No, you do not. No, absolutely not. But then on the on another brighter side, we saw a story that we have posted on our Facebook page, Hi. Supernatural Girls. That's a great Facebook page with lots of stories on it about floating crystals. Mm -hmm. Now, that was a wild story. So for everybody, there are photographs. There are videos of these floating crystals on our Facebook page. Again, go to Supernatural Girls. Give us a like. Follow us on Facebook. And you'll get to see all these amazing stories. So... Go check that story out. It is very, very unusual. It's called Levitating Rocks, and it's at a crystal mine in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. And they have a whole big story there of what's happening with these crystals. It has really spooked these people. So go check that out. And, of course, we have our usual UFO sightings more than ever. Yes. That is happening all over the place, and people with their camera phones are posting pictures, videos, and amazing, amazing things are going on in the world today with UFOs. We don't need disclosure, do we? We already know. So we're all set. With everyone with the camera in hand, you can't hide anything anymore. We cannot. After all, cannot. Big Brother's watching regardless, so now let's get the good pictures to go along with it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So we want to also uh, have you visit creativestrength.us. Mm -hmm. Tom Palladino is offering his 15-day free scalar treatment. You don't All have right. to give a credit card or anything. Just send your picture over to Tom, and he will do his scalar treatment for you. Again, that's creativestrength.us. So take a visit over there, and we've got some great books on our website, including the one we're going to be talking about tonight with Dr. Scott. Scott Kolbaba, which is called Physicians Untold Stories. So we're going to bring Dr. Kolbaba on the show in about one minute. Now, mm -hmm. let me just tell you a little about who we're talking to tonight. Right. He is an MD. He's in practice in Wheaton, Illinois, and he completed his residency at the famous Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. He is the father of seven wonderful children. And he also has a beautiful Newfoundland dog and now a kitten we just heard about who <laughs> wants to be friends with the Newfoundland <laughs> or maybe vice versa. But anyways, we're going to find out all about these great stories tonight. So, Dr. Kovama, welcome to the show. Thanks, Pat. It's great to be here. Thanks, PK. We're well, so lucky to have you with us tonight. We really are. We really are. So tell us a little bit about you, because you had an interesting experience starting out learning to be a doctor. You were kind of told you shouldn't be a doctor, right? Yeah, that was a very interesting experience. I um, started out in pre-med in college, and then I ended up in economics because some of the classes I was taking were what I thought were pretty boring. And people told me that this is exactly what medical school would be like. And I thought, if this is what medical school is going to be like, I'm going to be an economist. So I switched my grade <laughs> to economics. I graduated, and my grades weren't sterling. I wasn't a, a, a great student at the time. But I finished school, and I got out and started working. And then I realized one day that I didn't want to do this, and I wanted to go back to medical school. 
Well, that required prerequisite courses and a number of things. And I applied with only a B average and uh, some poor uh, MCAT scores, this, the test you take before medical school. And I interviewed with the dean of one of the prestigious medical schools in uh, Chicago. And I thought, this is a great thing. This is one of the most powerful men in medicine in Chicago at the time. And I was really excited to meet with him. And he looked at all my credentials, and looked at everything. And we had a nice talk. And at the end of the interview, he said, Mr. Kobaba, I'm afraid to tell you, you just don't have what it takes to become a doctor. You should change change your career <laughs> aspirations and get on with your life. Oh, Lord. And that was incredibly depressing for about a week. Uh, my wife recognized my, my bad mood. She tried to encourage me. But after about a week, I thought, well, you know, I've, I, I can go to night school. I can get some classes. I can get the prerequisites. I'll, I'll improve my MCAT scores. And I'm going to do this. And, and it, actually, his, his negative comments were the greatest incentive I could ever have. And I, was, I became a student on fire. I studied like crazy. I was studying night and day. I, got, I improved my MCAT scores from about the 20th percentile to over the 90th percentile. Got oh some great grades in my, my night classes. And I ultimately got in. Um, and the interesting Amazing. thing about that, uh, Pat, is... Uh, I did. I decided, you know, you do medical school for four years, then you do your residency for for the, the in the, my specialty, it's three years. And I did my first year residency at the same institution that he was at, oh. <laughs> and it was very interesting. Uh, talk about talk about uh, getting back uh, quietly. Mm -hmm. uh, I was awarded the intern of the year, and guess who had to present <gasps> the oh, oh. <laughs> what fabulous. Justice. Oh. Of there, so that was kind of interesting. I, I got a kick out of that, and uh, oh, I bet so, so. <laughs> incredible, huh? Oh my so god, that, that was, was he surprised? Did you see a big shocked look on his face? Yeah, I think he remembered me, and uh, <laughs> uh, I think that was a surprising kind of a, a turn of events. So you never know, uh, you know, and and that's taught me that you you the the, the power of the human spirit is is. Oh. Uh, uh, unbelievable. It is. It's unflappable. And certainly you took a, a situation which could have been extremely dis discouraging and you could have lived with that for the rest of your life, but you turned it around and you made it exactly what you wanted it to be. So what an achievement. Amazing. It, it, was, it was a lot of work, but uh, it was worth it. And like I said, sometimes a negative um, review and a negative opinion is, is all the incentive you need. And that mm -hmm. was for me. That was a, I, I just was amazing after that. that I could stop great. it. Yeah. That's great. And so that, that your wife must have been happy to see you apply yourself and do what you really wanted to do as well. That's terrific. Yeah, she gave up. Uh, she was an anthropologist and she gave up huh? a dig yeah. in the Yucatan. Uh, when I announced I wanted to go to medical school, she said, "Okay, I'll 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 work and put you through school, and I'll give up my opportunity to to do on a dig oh. in anthropology." So it's kind of a mixed blessing there, but uh, she appreciates uh, uh, what I've what I've done, and and she was a great help to me. She was a great support. Oh. Isn't Sounds that like you're good partners, very good partners, good team, yeah. amazing. Mm -hmm. So now that brings us to this amazing book that you've written that has touched our hearts. Mm -hmm. Just incredible. Now, what made you want to do a book like this, Dr. Kolbaba? What was it that, that brought you to this place? I always thought writing a book might be fun and interesting. And so I, I thought um, I, I had a few experiences myself that were really a little bit on the edge of, of uh, normal. And then... I had a couple doctors come up to me, and doctors, these are stories that are, are amazing stories, uh, even to me, and even when I talk about them, I, I still get sometimes emotional because they're such amazing stories. And I've, I've never heard stories like this before this from doctors. You hear about potassiums and gallbladders and all the mm -hmm. kinds of things that doctors yeah. talk about with patients yeah. and, and mm -hmm. making a diagnosis or missing a diagnosis or whatever, but we don't talk about deep spiritual things like this but for some reason after i had a couple experiences myself a couple doctors uh, started to uh, got me aside and 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 told me these stories the one uh, was was an interesting story from steve heim who's an orthopedic surgeon who's also a trauma surgeon he was skiing with his wife mm. and his wife's sister in colorado and they uh, 
found a, a new mountain they'd never skied down. Uh, they were expert skiers. They got up to the top of the mountain, a blizzard hit, and they could hardly see anything in front of them. The temperature dropped, the snow was coming down like crazy, but they had to ski down. So they started skiing down, and they, they about halfway down, they came to a, a grove of trees. They had to go to the right or the left. Dr. Heim, Steve went to the right, and the girls went to the left, and they didn't know they were separated for a few seconds until Dr. Heim realized that, and decided to ski back through the through the trees to get to the girls. And while he was skiing through the trees, he suddenly felt this very, very uneasy and uncomfortable feeling in his chest, like something dreadful was happening, like he was being called on to do something that uh, had life and death proportions. So he stopped skiing. The girls were still waiting for him on the other side. He, he suspected that, but he, he just stopped skiing, and everything became silent. The, the wind was blowing, the snow was coming down, but it was an eerie silence. He could hear himself breathing. He could hear the crunch of the snow, which was very cold on his, uh, on his skis and his feet. He took off his skis, and he stu stood there for a minute, not knowing what to do. And then he did something amazing and surprising. He started to walk up the mountain, up. Uh, climb, walk, climb, walk. The girls were in the opposite direction, and he's walking away from them and for, for an unknown reason. After about 100 feet, he came to a large pine tree with a tree well that goes down to the base of the tree and then it comes up to the five feet of snow that, that was surrounding the, the trees. And he stood there for a second, then they looked down, and then he suddenly realized why he was there. Under the tree was a body covered in snow. My God. Mm. He brushed off. You know, he's a trauma surgeon. So what a coincidence that a trauma surgeon would happen to be at the site of, of major trauma. So wow. he brushed off the fellow's face and it looked like he was dead. He had a gray face. He didn't look like he was breathing. But a trauma surgeon it knows what to do. So he put his hand on his carotid artery to see if he had a pulse. And sure enough, he had a pulse. It was a weak, thready pulse, but it was a pulse. So he immediately went into trauma mode. He brushed the snow off this, this hapless skier that had hit the tree, covered him with his two jackets, started yelling for help, put his head down, all the things a trauma surgeon would do. And, and uh, one of the last skiers down the mountain must have heard his cries for help. And he came to his side and he said, what can I do? And Dr. Himes said, go down and call the, the ski patrol as soon as you can find a phone or get to the lodge or get, get someone up here as soon as possible. This fellow's ready to die any minute. My so goodness. about 20 minutes later, a snowmobile with a gurney behind it was was driven by the snow patrol and they came up and loaded this unconscious skier under this under the gurney brought him down to the ambulance waiting at the lodge and took him off to the hospital meantime dr heim who's now got tons of adrenaline on board is shaking with with adrenaline mm -hmm. and also with cold and covered himself back up and skied over to where the where the girls were they skied down the down the mountain to the lodge the next day he called the uh, the hospital to find out what happened to the skier. And they said, you did a great job uh, splinting his leg. He had a broken leg, and Dr. Heim splinted it in the field with a tree branch and some undergarments. And and uh, he's alive. He's well. He's speaking. Wow. There's no serious damage at all. He was unconscious from hitting the tree. And hypothermic, had you not found him, no one would have found him till, till the springtime, probably. Oh, my oh, God. So, wow. So Dr. Heim said to me uh, about this, he said, I, I, I know now that there's something higher than us that has directed me to this skier because uh, there was, it didn't make any sense that I would be climbing up a mountain in the middle of a blizzard. And he, he literally saved, saved the skier. It's so incredible. I, yes. It is and, fascinating. And that he listened. <laughs> he listened to something else talking to him about going up that mountain. Because like you just said, why go up a mountain in a blizzard? It didn't make any logical mm -hmm. sense at all. No, it didn't. And away from the girl, so nothing made any sense. He felt so compelled, though, that he told me he could not do anything but that. He, wow. And, and, you know, I think we all get little premonitions and little hints mm -hmm. of things, and, and some of those are interesting and some of those may be meaningful, but he was, someone was shouting at him to climb up that mountain, and he couldn't do anything but. And so that's that's what happened to him. And after I heard that story and a couple others from doctors that just happened by coincidence, I guess, to come to me, mm -hmm. I decided to meet with, uh, now, First, let me, let me back up a little bit. Doctors have uh, patients in every profession you can imagine, including uh, the oldest profession, I suspect. Yeah. <laughs> so, 
And so I, I have a publisher in my in my practice, and I called my publisher up, and I said, I've got some stories I'd like to talk with you about because I don't know if they'd make a good book. Can you have lunch with me, and I'll tell you a few stories and tell me what you think, honestly. And he said, okay, I'll be honest with you. I'll tell you exactly what I think. So we had lunch, and I told him a few of these stories. And I was eating and busy telling the stories and eating and didn't pay much attention to him until he stopped eating. And he, he sat there for a bit, and I looked up to see what was going on, and he had tears in his eyes. Oh. And I, his name is Scott, just like mine. That's why I like him so much. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Scott, do you really think these are, are good stories? And I said, these are, these are amazing stories. You have to write these down. You have to publish a book. And so that's what that's what started. The, and then I, I would hang out in the doctor's lounge after that and, and get doctors and ask them if they had any unusual stories that they couldn't explain scientifically. Mm-hmm. And there were lots, lots of stories that doctors don't talk about. And so I... We don't think of doctors that way also. So you're allowing us an insight uh, with doctors that I don't think we've ever had before. I mean, we think of doctors, as you wrote about in the book, as men and women of science Mm -hmm. that go by the facts, you know, go by the, the AMA way. And we don't necessarily think of doctors as having experiences like this. So you've really opened up our world to see this. My, my world, too, because, again, doctors don't talk about this. Up until the last five or six years, I never have heard anything like this before. And suddenly I started to hear these, these stories, and it, it, was, it was shocking to me and, and amazing to me. And one of the sections in the book is a section on what I learned about docs and talking to docs about these intimate, deep spiritual stories, which was uh, just an a eye-opener to me and amazing to me. It is amazing. Now, is there any room for this in medical school? I, I think there is, and I think we're we're seeing more and more studies uh, about things like prayer, for example, and and right. does prayer make a difference in in healing, and does a positive attitude make a difference, and and I I think we're going to be seeing more and more of this of this kind of thing in, in medical school, and and my hope in writing this book was also that I'd like to get doctors talking about these things more and more, so that maybe that will open a dialogue between doctors and doctors and patients, and also in, in medical schools and mm-hmm. medical education. Well, it's an important subject. Yeah. And as you mentioned, and you know, you get from a lot of these stories that you're telling, it's the difference between life and death sometimes. I mean, here's a perfect example that you just gave us of this doctor listening to the divine voice and going in an opposite direction right. of logic and rationale. And so that has to be, I think, encouraged. And who wouldn't want a doctor? like that you know who's listening Definitely. to a higher voice than than just whatever you learned in medical school i mean it's really it gives us as patients a, a sense of comfort that mm-hmm. that's a possibility it's interesting though pat that many of the doctors when i talk with them were really afraid to share these stories for fear that they would be criticized for huh? being different for having an unusual experience for in believing in something uh, beyond science. And so Mm -hmm. that was a great concern with almost every doctor, including myself. I was a little worried. What would my my patients say about this? Would they think I was a a little strange or different or something and not want to be involved with me in the practice? And just the opposite happened. It was very surprising. Uh, We we had a launch for the book and lots of the doctors showed up. And they were treated like like returning heroes that they had opened up. <laughs> oh, that's uh, wonderful! That has never been touched before, and, mm-hmm. and and the reason I think they were is because most people, I'm convinced, either personally or through their families, have had stories of unusual things that have happened to them, their loved ones, someone that had died that they want to share too and they have recognized that when these doctors uh, uh, came out with these stories that it was okay for them to share their stories too and i hear that in the office all the time i have have people tell me their stories which are absolutely uh, amazing in many cases that is so wonderful so you've opened up a brand new dialogue all the way Mm -hmm. around for everybody and how healing it is that you've done this and Oh, my goodness. You've got so many wonderful stories here. Now, the one that touched me the most was the story about the woman with MS. Uh, and yes. she only had, they thought, 
the doctor thought she's got a week and she's she's gone. She had been through a lot. She had had MS for many years. But please tell us a little bit about that story. It, it just I cried so hard. I mean, it was just a great story. This is Barbara Kaminsky, who is a, a, a Wheaton resident who moved away uh, after the, this has happened about 20 some years ago. And she moved away. And the interesting part of this story, before I get into the story, Pat, is that I had trouble finding her in, in the country. Mm -hmm. I had all kinds of search engines that I purchased and, and, and looking for patients because I needed permission to publish her story. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, I, I sent away letters, I made phone calls to the numbers that were on the search engine sites and uh, nothing, uh, no response. And I had to turn in my Panya script this particular week. And I was so upset because this is such a great story that I couldn't. Mm -hmm. I couldn't put it in the book. I would had to have to withdraw it from the book because she couldn't give me permission. And so all of a sudden, the night before I had to turn the manuscript in, guess who called? Oh, oh that's a supposed to be. Barbara Kaminsky called. She said to me, wow. Dr. Kobaba, I got a letter from you about six months ago, and I thought I was going to call you right away, but I kind of put it off. And and I realized that you know it's been a while, and I, you don't mind if if I you know uh, call you now. And I said, Oh my goodness, you don't know what what, <laughs> what, a, what a coincidence this is that you would oh. call. She gave me her permission, and uh, I was able to submit her story. The story is very interesting. She was a, a young lady that developed multiple sclerosis and had all the complications. She had decreased Terrible. vision and legal blindness. She had uh, paralyzed diaphragm. She required a tracheostomy, which is a tube into the, the, into the neck to help her breathe. She had braces on. Ultimately, she couldn't walk. She was having recurrent infections. There was just a whole <clears throat> host of things. And Dr. Marshall, who was my friend that took care of her, finally enrolled her in hospice, which means that he has to certify that she has less than six months to live. And when the pastor visited her, Dr. Marshall visited her, they thought that would be the last time they would visit her because she was going downhill so rapidly. What was interesting then, about the same time, a radio show uh, was having uh, 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 prayer sessions for people that were in des desperate uh, straits. And so they, had a, uh, they, they solicited prayers for her. And uh, a couple days after the radio show, maybe a week or so after the radio show, uh, Barbara Kaminsky was in her bedroom, uh, lying in bed and, and you know, uh, expecting not to live for very much longer. And her aunt came in with this big bag of letters that had, uh, for people that had offered prayers for her. And it was so heavy she could hardly carry it. She brought it into the room and they sat talking and they were really pleased that everyone had, had, had said a prayer for her that had heard the radio show. And all of a sudden, she heard a voice in the room that no one else heard. And the voice said, young, young lady, uh, something like, um, uh, young lady, uh, get up and walk. She immediately said to her, to her aunt, I heard the voice of God tell me to get up. And she, then she got out of bed. She stood up. She took her braces off. Oh, the occupational chills. therapist yeah. oh, God. <laughs> that was there ran up to her and said, you can't take your oxygen off. You're, you're not going to be able to breathe. And Barbara Kaminsky took her oxygen off, went and walked into the next room. Her parents were there. She was so excited that she was able to sit and stand up. She bounced on the couch about 20 times, up and down and up and down. <laughs> she got a going. The parents were crying. Uh, they offered a prayer of thanks, thankfulness that, that, that she was literally cured. Uh, she wasn't short of breath. She was able to breathe well. Her vision came back. Her strength was back. She even did a little ballet, some ballet moves that she had remembered from high school uh, in the room for her for yeah. her parents. The next day was church at, in the evening. They had church service in the evening. And Barbara decided to go to, to church. And, and she was very, very spiritual, very religious, and very closely connected to all the people in the church, including the pastor, who had been to visit her a couple of days before and, and felt that she was not going to live for probably more than a week or so. And so she didn't have any clothes to wear because her mother had given all of her clothes away because she knew she would never wear clothes again because she was oh. so sick. Mm. So she had to borrow some clothes from, from the neighbor. And that's why she became late and going, going to church. And when she entered the, the church building, she stood there for a minute in the foyer where the pastor could see her. He was doing some announcements at the pulpit, and he just stopped talking. He couldn't speak. 
he thought he was seeing a ghost. And she walked into the church. Everyone turned around to see her, and they, they, there were whispers all over the church. Is that Barbara Kaminsky? I thought she was dead. I thought she had, I thought she was in hospice. And uh, suddenly, as if directed by a, a mysterious divine hand, the whole congregation began to sing uh, uh, Amazing Grace. Can you imagine a person who had ah, to die, just... the whole church singing Amazing Grace, and the pastor standing there, not able to speak. He was in such shock. So such incredible. I mean, I this is this one got me. Makes you want to cry. <laughs> I know it just. Oh my goodness! I mean, it's like something out of a movie. But this really happened. I mean, this woman yes. was healed. I mean, from death's door, from yes, death's she door, she was taken back into life, and to show up at the church like that, yeah. and walk. I mean, this is a woman who couldn't walk. She was bedridden. I mean, walk into the church. Unbelievable. I mean, just, oh, I mean, this yeah. is what gives people hope. This is yeah. what, what yeah. does it. Sure. Oh, my goodness. My goodness. And what a beautiful story. And thank God she called you to give you permission so oh, we could yes. all read <laughs> Oh, goodness. What a, what a quote coincidence, huh, huh Pat? Oh, and, and that's came, some uh, kind of coincidence, yeah, so I'll tell you. That was no coincidence, huh? It was all she, part and parcel of it. She decided after that experience to dedicate her life to helping others. And she indeed has. Over the last 20-some years, she's married to a, a minister in out east. Uh, she's dedicated her life to helping her congregation and she does a youth program and she she does amazing things to help uh, people and she's Not dedicated bad. her life to do that oh, so, a shining yeah. example of spirit in action well yes. we're going to take a short break everybody so just stay tuned this is this is a memorable show so oh, we gosh, will yes. be back in just a few minutes you are listening to supernatural girls radio we'll be right back <laughs> Welcome back, everyone, to Supernatural Girls Radio. I am your host, Patricia Baker, and I'm here with my co-host, Patricia Kirkman, PK, and our incredible guest we are so honored to have with us tonight, yes, Dr. We are. J. Kolbaba, who is the author of this book that is amazing. Yes. It's in case you're interested in what stories. it looks like, it's That's quick to right. find. There it is. Miraculous experiences. Doctors are hesitant to share with their patients or anyone. And somehow, Dr. Kobaba has managed to gain their trust and have them speak out about these experiences. So good for you, Dr. Kobaba. Yeah. Now, I've, I've got a question here. I think you've already answered it, but I'm going to bring it up again because it's an important one. Uh, okay. Christian is writing. Is Dr. Kobaba still actively collecting more stories from patients. Absolutely, yes. I'm writing oh, another book, and uh, we are working on a television series, so we'll need some stories for the television series, oh, too. So we'll, uh, I'm interested in any stories that you have. You can log on to our, our website, physiciansuntoldstories.com, write a little blurb about that, and we'll either call you or communicate with you to get some details. So I'm very interested in, in uh, stories you can't explain scientifically. Oh, oh, that's terrific. Fabulous. Yes. Terrific. What a fabulous gift to the public. Yes. Wonderful. Wonderful. That is now, for sure. Here is a statement. This is an interesting one from Sky33 who said, I have heard that voice, the voice that we were just talking about that Barbara heard. Mm -hmm. In March of 2000, when the doctor said, without surgery, I will die very soon. You've reached the High Fashion Hotline. Hi, my husband and kids just gave me an executive order. Stylish new outfits now. Where do I go? Get to Old Navy. Old Navy? Yep, get up to 50% off store-wide during Old Navy's big President's Day sale. Up to 50% off store-wide? I won't veto that. Old Navy's fashion-forward jeans start at just 15 bucks for adults, 10 bucks for kids. And colorful fleece starts at just 15 bucks for adults, 12 bucks for kids at Old Navy and OldNavy.com. But hurry, the sale ends soon. Well, just call me Shopper-in-Chief. We're going to Old Navy now. High Fashion, Old Navy. Valid 212 through 220. Select styles only. The voice told me in a very strict way not to have the surgery. I heard it three times. Bottom line, I'm still here. 
<laughs> and I no longer fear death. What a wonderful story, huh? It's a great story. It's a great story. I think funny things happen to us in this life that we can't explain. And I think it all points to something that's higher than us. Most of the docs Definitely. called it God. Uh, you can call it whatever you like. But I think there's yeah. something else out there that we can't explain. But uh, uh, we, we get touched by that that hand periodically. And, and uh, it's amazing that that happens. Now, you've personally been touched by that hand. Tell us about that for you. What oh, happens? Yes. It happened more than once, so yeah. uh, tell us what you can. There's a there's a number of times that, that uh, that's happened to me, and most of the doctors that I talk with have had just one amazing experience, but, but you know, many have had little kinds of experiences. Um, probably there's a couple of things that, that have happened to me. I think one of them... Um, uh, that was most uh, amazing was was um, a, a bus incident with my daughter Lucci. Lucci is a show choir girl she, for the high school, and so she was singing and dancing with the show choir. And we had a big show choir competition in, in uh, near La Crosse, Wisconsin, which is about five hours from Chicago. So they took off in the bus. Uh, we followed them about an hour later, and about uh, an hour into the trip, or maybe a little longer, we got a phone call from Lucci. And she sounded a little strange on the phone. She has a cell. All the girls have cell phones, obviously, as you know. And she said, uh, "Dad, there was a little little fire in the bus, but we, you know, we're okay, and and don't worry, we're 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 fine now." And so we didn't think too much about it until we came about an hour later to a uh, a scene on the top of a hill. There were police cars all over the place, fire engines. Mm -hmm. And there was a bus uh, that was a big coach bus that was burning with black smoke coming from up out, out of the bus. The, total, the whole bus was incinerated. Oh. And my wife said, that's Lucci's bus. My and God. That was her bus. And we found out later that what happened was that there was a flat tire in the back of the bus that the bus driver and no one recognized. They heard a bang and then nothing happened. But the rubber from the tire must have caught a uh, must must have caused enough friction to cause a fire. The bus driver, when he realized that, pulled the bus over. And uh, there were two buses involved, so the, the second bus uh, that was behind them saw how, how big the fire and how rapidly the fire was progressing, and they started to text the girls in the, in the first bus, get out, get out, there's a fire in your, in your bus. And all of a sudden, the bus started to fill with smoke, the floor became hot, uh, and the girls started to scream, they had to get out. My daughter was one of the last ones in the bus, in the, in the back of the bus. Oh my. And so she was frightened to death that she was going to be burned. You could see the flames in the side of the bus. Uh, and then something very interesting happened that the, the people in the back, in the uh, former, the other bus, uh, observed. And that is the flames seemed to die down and just stay at a quiet, mm. low-level uh, amount of fire for quite a while. And every girl was able to get out of the bus. When the last girl stepped off the bus, the kids in the first and the second bus said a wall of flames swept through the bus and incinerated everything in the bus. My so, God. Oh. So, and that was the costumes, everything. But oh none of the goodness. girls was hurt in the least. <clears throat> they were what a they miracle. Were, they were, it was a miracle. And then, it was because there was no reason that that fire would have been stopped for a moment. I mean, it, it really did come to a halt, it which really fire did. doesn't do that. No. Fire exponentially Not that I've ever seen. like every second. Yeah. So that in and of itself is just an amazing, amazing miracle. And they all got off the bus safely. Thank God. Yeah, wow. the, that's not the end of the story, though. Interestingly, they uh, went to the, yeah, the hotel uh, <laughs> that night. It got in about two o'clock a.m. And we thought, oh, this is too bad. Everything was burned up in the bus, the costumes, the underclothes, the, uh, everything except the instruments. And the, uh, the choir director, uh, we expected, she was. She made an announcement, we were expecting to say, you know, well, pack up your things in the morning, we're going to take off and go back home. But she surprised us. She said, we're going on stage. Whatever we can do, we're going on stage tomorrow, we're going to compete. <laughs> we were shocked. Because wow. there were wow. no costumes and nothing. Nothing. Nothing so to that, work with. That set into a, 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 a into motion a series of events that were were as miraculous as the 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 bus fire, and that is uh, they went to the uh, home school to see if they had any costumes. Well, there were 50 girls. They had 25 costumes, not enough for the whole crowd. And then someone went to the uh, high, our high school, went back to our high school in Wheaton, 
they found 25 costumes that were almost identical to the costumes that were at the school. Oh, for heaven's sakes. One was purple sequin <laughs> and one was white sequin, matched, uh, kind of matching, but uh, a nice contrast. Uh, and they looked just like they were paired together. The next morning, my, my wife was in charge of costuming, and so she was taking in seams and out seams because these were unfitted costumes. And, and, yeah. And, uh, yes. So much work to get that done. Oh. Usually that takes months. Yeah, exactly. They use duct tape, safety pins. <laughs> and the interesting thing, people showed up from the from the, the homes that school and also from all over with shoes because the kids had no shoes. They were all burned up and they would, would take off their shoes and say, You can wear my shoes for the for the show. Oh. One of the one of the women in the in the in the uh, room that was helping out with all the costuming said, "This must be what heaven's like." People were so generous and kind, and everything was going really incredibly well, and they were able to perform. Uh, and only an hour later than they than their scheduled time, they performed at noon that that next day. And it's interesting that a coincidence, maybe, uh, uh, Pat and, and PK, that that uh, one of the songs was about overcoming adversity. Interesting. Oh my. How perfect that is. <laughs> After that song, there were no dry eyes in the whole audience. Mm -hmm. It was just an amazing song. And they sang it with such such emotion that, that you can imagine the, the feeling in the, in the audience at the time. Oh, incredible. At the end of the performance and at the end of the whole competition, there were the awards. And uh, there were a third, third place was announced, second place was announced, and first place was announced, and we didn't, we didn't win. Uh, but the girls thought that they had done their best and that they, um, you know, they, they, they did the best they could. Mm -hmm. Then they realized there was, that wasn't the end. They brought a huge trophy onto the stage for the grand champions. That was announced. Ah. We won the grand champion. Isn't that oh my God! Oh. My goodness gracious! That, that was an oh. amazing event. My daughter came back to the homeroom. We said nothing. We just hugged each other. She'd she'd survived the bus fire. They came through an amazing experience, and they won it all. So oh. that was a that was a competition that I'll never forget, and an amazing series of events that I think were divinely inspired. Oh, it definitely sounds that way. Definitely yes, sounds that way. God's hand all the way through from the beginning all the way to the end. Oh, my goodness. Just an incredible, another, another story. Incredible, that's, that's for book sure. That brought tears to our eyes. Just amazing. Now, here's another uh, actually a question coming from the same person who wrote about getting guidance from the voice. And Sky33 would like to know, Has have you had any cases where the patient went against doctor's life and death advice and the patient had an experience, be it God or ETs or angels, and the patient listened to the voice instead of the doctors and was fine. Yes, we have. There, there are lots of experiences like that. The most uh, significant one that comes to mind is a, is a case that uh, was told me by my friend, Dr. Richard Jorgensen, who's a general surgeon. And he one night had had a busy day. This was a, a very busy day. He was exhausted. He, he he went right to sleep. Doctors usually don't have trouble sleeping. They go right to sleep <laughs> after a busy day. And he woke with a cold sweat about four o'clock in the morning uh, with a dream that was just so vivid that he couldn't get it out of his mind. His best friend, a judge, an appellate judge, uh, he dreamt was uh, dead in a coffin in the, in a funeral home. They could visualize the people lining up to see him. They could he could visualize his face uh, in in the coffin, and it was so. Uh, in most dreams, when you wake up in the morning, they they go out of your mind. Quickly, yes. Really mm -hmm. But this one was so dramatic and so real that he couldn't forget it. He, it. It kind of upset him the whole day. A few months before that, he had been talking to someone that told him that if you have a dream, the earth spirit tells you if it's a dream about someone else, you have to tell them. So mm -hmm. he felt somewhat compelled to tell the judge. So he, he didn't know how to call up a, a good friend and say, I, I saw you dead in my dream. <laughs> oh, really? Thank <laughs> you very you, much. How do you do that? <clears throat> yeah. right. the same response that he got when he called the judge. He said, uh, you know, um, 
uh, my friend, uh, I had a dream about you last night, and I dreamt that you were dead. And the judge laughed, and he said, you know, that was kind of a crazy dream. But Dr. Jorgensen said, if you would do just just a favor for me, just get a physical, make sure that you're healthy, that you're okay. And uh, the judge said, well, that wouldn't be unreasonable. I can do that. I've not had a physical for many years, and I've been negligent, mm -hmm. and I should get a physical anyway. So he did. He went to a doctor that we all know very well, got a physical. It was perfectly fine. His uh, heart was good. His blood tests were fine. EKG, chest X-ray, all the tests you do for a physical were perfectly fine. The doctor even told him, to "Don't listen to this this crazy surgeon, Doctor Jorgensen, anymore." <laughs> oh no! <laughs> because he doesn't know what he's talking about. You're perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with your heart. Go on, live your life, and and be fine. Well. He that, he thought that was okay, and then when Dr. Jorgensen heard that, he got that sick feeling in his stomach again. That there is mm -hmm. something that he needed to do. That 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 this wasn't right. That that the dream was too vivid, too real, and too emotional. So he called him up again, and he said, "Judge, I know I know that you did what I said you you could you should do, but I'd like you to do one more thing. Could you just see my cardiologist? Just just." humor me just did one visit see him and then i'll then i'll leave you alone forever i won't talk about this ever again <laughs> and he felt somewhat guilty because if if nothing came with this he'd you know he feel a little strange trying to trying to force him to see more doctors when right. he didn't need to yes exactly so the judge went to see the cardiologist the cardiologist did a stress test and some other tests he failed the stress test badly was put in the hospital for an angiogram the angiogram showed a major uh, lesion called the widow maker which ah. is a main artery that mm -hmm. supplies virtually the whole heart with blood and mm -hmm. multiple other lesions that were very very dangerous they took him to surgery the next day because they were afraid to wait longer than a day because he might have a fatal heart attack just in waiting he did a bypass. He lived for many, many years after that. Was very thankful to Dr. Jorgensen for listening to his dream and listening to his his intuition, mm -hmm. uh, and going against the, the the voice of the very excellent internist that had seen the judge and advised against him having anything else done. So there is the Gosh, case. Gosh, oh, it's just beautiful. You yeah. know, it's a, such a beautiful story. And, and again, it's a great, great lesson uh, to all of us that to keep following that voice because here he had gone to the doctor once and everything was fine. Yes. So it would have been easy for this, this doctor to drop everything at that point and say, okay, I just must have had a, a weird dream, end of story. Yes. But yes. he kept listening internally to that voice that said no there's something else here and and that is a good just a good rule of thumb is that if there is a dream that is that vivid and makes sense you know in that dream it makes sense you know he was seeing a body in a coffin and people lining up to go view the body i mean that's not usually what you see in a dream i was a dream therapist for years so i know you usually have very disjointed disconnected images yes. and when the images follow a line of thought that's very much in line with everyday life you really need to pay attention thank god he did wow yes, yes. and you know one of the themes there there's some themes that emerge from a book i, I just collected a bunch of stories and and i, I didn't have any specific uh requirement for the stories except they had to give me goosebumps or make me cry uh, out of out of emotion and those are the stories I included in the book but it was interesting that many of the stories involved uh, people listening to a little voice or or the uh, 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 emotion or a premonition and I think that that became a theme that I hope people people listen to. I hope that people realize that if they see a stranger and across the street and they have this this uh, voice or some intuition that says, "I need to go uh, meet that person or or talk with them or do something," uh, at least listen to that and and pay attention because sometimes I think those are things that are more than just a little feeling. I think those are are, are things that that uh, someone upstairs is telling us that there is something that we need to be doing and and. Uh, then we become a servant of, of, uh, of a higher power. And that's where the real power is. And it's so important to know that there are doctors that are listening to that voice. Because, I, I mean, it's you guys have a, and you, men and women in the medical field. You have such a tough job. You're trying to figure out these medical mysteries. And I think lots of these illnesses are becoming more mysterious, especially the autoimmune group yes. as we go forward. It's very tough to diagnose a lot of these things. Yes. So, you know, when you have that connection with the higher power, then you have an advantage. And 
it must give you some comfort as a doctor that you have that advantage. You know, I, I think we, we still obviously believe in the scientific method. We, we believe in modern medicine and the, the, you know, the use of uh, radiology and all the things that we have at our, our disposal. But there are some circumstances where you just have some feeling or or are or, or I think directed, and uh, you don't want to do any crazy tests or anything like that. But I think if you have those feelings, uh, I think we should listen to them. My my partner, Dr. Boren, is a good example of that. He tells stories about uh, pre-oping a, a fellow that had a uh, uh, was going to have a total joint surgery. And he felt that he was cleared for surgery, and then he had this voice uh, nagging in the back of his head, this guy needs a stress test, guy needs a stress test. So he finally called him up and said, I've got this feeling you just need to have a stress test, and I'm sorry to have to put you through this. And, and so he did. He had a stress test, and he flunked the stress test again. <laughs> oh, no. Bypass surgery that saved his life uh, because had he gone to surgery, he probably would have not survived the surgery. So there are things in, in, in that we can't explain that I think help guide us at times. Um, but again, most of, of us, most doctors believe in the scientific method, believe in all the things that, that we're taught in medical school. But there is some, there's a dimension here that is a little beyond that, that I think we just need to pay a little bit of attention to. And I, I'd encourage other people to pay attention to their feelings too, mm -hmm. uh, in certain circumstances. Well, I think that's great advice, and, and it's great advice for patients also, because that goes both ways. It's not just the doctors that can tune in to the higher power, but it's also patients. And as Sky33 brought up, he listened, or she, I'm not sure, um, to that, that loud voice that said, don't have the surgery, and turned out to be fine. So, yeah, we, we need to work together, I think, patients and doctors as team players yes. so that we can find the best treatment and, and the best answer to some of these medical mysteries. And everybody's different. You know that better than anybody, right? Yes, yes. It's scary when you take a look at the things that we're given information about and how often we disregard it. Mm. And when you follow through, it's just like a blessing, such yeah. a blessing. Yeah. That is. Again, we're, you know, we're not given uh, direct information on everything, but there are times when I think mm. we need to pay attention to some of the things that are, are telling us in the back of our head. Some of the docs uh, in, in their stories uh, really couldn't help themselves do these these things, like Dr. Hyman climbing up the mountain. He, yes. he just felt mm -hmm. so compelled. But I think there are lots of times when we have little naggy thoughts that aren't that compelling. And I think we, could, we should listen to those in many cases, too, uh, especially mm -hmm. if they're telling us to do something that makes sense or that's good or that, that is not harmful to anyone. Yeah, I think yes. many times we get that fear factor and we can imagine something much worse than it actually is because of that, what we'll call that gut feeling. Yes. And if we really pay attention to it, it gets us out of harm's way. Right. I think it does sometimes, yes. Yes, it, it does. It gives us a whole other insight to some of these medical conundrums that we're facing today. And and again, you know, as patients, we don't we don't know sometimes what to ask for. You have access True. as a doctor to all of these tests and things, and we rely on the medical profession to get us to get the right tests and then to the right diagnosis. But I think in this day and age, it's going to take it takes more, even though our mm -hmm. tests have improved and we have more technology than we've ever had before we still need that connection to the higher power to make yeah, some I, of these these things right yes i, I gave a talk the other day to a, a religious a church group and the, the the topic was in this modern medical world with all the technology that we have is there still room for spirituality and medicine and my, mm. my overwhelming response was mm. yes there is there's still room for prayer there's still room for spirituality there's still room for believing in something else that is the master mm -hmm. healer and not just us beautiful yes it's so Definitely. true now, have you ever had, you must have had some of these experiences with your seven children. Um, you know, uh, all kinds of things happen with seven children. Here. <laughs> <There's> <laughs> yes. Uh, it seems like happening. I think the most spectacular was the Lucci bus fire. I think yes, that was, that was, that was, the, that the, was. Most, 
Mm-hmm. And uh, that must have been when that happened. You must have been elated for for days. I mean, beyond the experience of her life being saved and then winning the grand championship and seeing how miraculous all of this was. That must have just given you such a buoyancy for such a long time. You, you know, it, uh, 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 Pat, it was a mixed feeling because. The, the mixed feeling was uh, a terror that, that we could have lost our daughter wow. that That's night. Nice. Mm-hmm. And, and the emotion of, uh, you know, the, you can imagine kind of trembling inside, thinking she could have been burned up on that bus. She was one of the last ones to get out of the bus. And she could have been incinerated and in and, 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 and that night. Mm-hmm. And then the elation of, of, of having everything come together so amazingly well the next day yeah. so that they can perform within hours of when they were supposed to be performing and only about eight hours after everything had been destroyed. So there was yeah. elation and also great emotion. And I think mm-hmm. uh, my wife probably had more of the uh, anxiety emotion. Yeah. Uh, I had uh, a lot of the elation. But still, when you think about what could have happened to your daughter, like cause she yes. could have been up in the bus, that was just so scary. Oh, Especially terrifying. after she says there was a little fire on the bus. Yeah. 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 I, yes. And hearing that, I'm going, oh, my God. And then when you uh, saw it, that had to be yes. devastating when you saw the bus. Yes, exactly. Yeah, the coach. The coach told her not to to frighten the the, the parents, so they were all stepped in <laughs> to say oh. that there was not the bus ah. burn up. It's not sitting here with five fire trucks and twenty oh. police cars. It's just a little fire, yeah. really. Just, just a little, a little fire. fire. Yeah. Well, we're going to take another very short commercial oh. break. If you have a question for Dr. Kobaba, then please write it in the chat room at irnchat.com. That is irnchat.com. We'll ask your question on your behalf. And we have lots more stories to talk about tonight. So stay tuned, everybody. You are listening to Supernatural Girls Radio. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone, to Supernatural Girls Radio. I'm your host, Patricia Baker. I'm here with my co-host, PK, and our amazing Man, guest tonight, yes. Oh, yes. Dr. How lucky Scott we are. How Jay lucky we are. Kobaba. He is the author of an amazing book, and you all have to get it and read get it. You have to. Book. You have to. You have to. It is so great. Physicians, oh. Untold Stories miraculous experiences doctors are hesitant to share with their patients or anyone what a christmas or hanukkah gift or whatever oh. kind of holiday you celebrate but get them i mean kleenex to go with it you've got <laughs> yes. to have kleenex to go with the book that's right Not lots of kleenex it is and it's absolutely. happy tears it's happy tears definitely absolutely. it's a feel good now, to the nth degree Ah, it's great. Now, I have a question for you from the chat room, and this is from Carol Carl. She would like to know, what is your analysis of why mainstream medicine in the Western world shuns this approach? Is it based on the notion that each individual is capable of accessing healing without the help of doctors? Um, well, I, I think the question was why why do uh, doctors and many others uh, shun the, the spiritual side of medicine? And I think we are all trained to to do the scientific method, which I think is very reasonable. The scientific method is great. Uh, you you believe in uh, experiments, and you believe that uh, you know certain things uh, happen when when uh, uh, when you when you do uh, certain procedures and tests and so forth, but uh, when you've been in practice for a while, you begin to realize there are things that happen that just don't fit into the scientific method totally. And so, um, and those are a little scary. It's a little scary to say that not everything is scientifically based. And uh, it's hard to come to that realization unless you've actually experienced it or have other doctors that have, have experienced it too. So I think um, medicine, rightly so, uh, is uh, scientifically based, but the, I think but there is a uh, room, I think, for spirituality and medicine because there's something else out there that mm-hmm. doctors experience. And there are certain places where they experience it more than others. Uh, ER and the um, intensive care units are places where they have more of these uh, unusual experiences. And the literature from the or, from the uh, emergency rooms is is uh, uh, complete with with stories about these kinds of events. And and so I think we're I think it's coming around. More and more, and I think more and more doctors and more and more institutions and medical centers are going to be realizing that there's something to spirituality and, and to prayer and, and, and to believing and having a positive attitude. Right. 
That's wonderful change for everybody. It just creates so many more positive possibilities. Yes. It really does. And now in your book, you also have an interesting story. I mean, all the stories are just incredible, and they're all running through my mind right now. But <clears throat> you have a story from a chiropractor who yes. goes to a networking <laughs> meeting and has kind of, kind of takes them off in a different direction. <laughs> Can you tell us that story? Because uh, so far we've been talking about physical healings, but this is emotional and mental healing. So right. tell us about this one. That's great. Our, our chiropractor friend uh, was starting out in, in business in, in, a, in, in the local community here and uh, wanted to network and, and develop more referral sources and so forth. And, and that was reasonable when you first start out. You don't have very many patients and you want to make sure that people know who you are and that you're a reasonable person. So he attended this meeting that was attended by all the leaders and, and uh, the medical uh, professionals in the area. And he thought this is a great opportunity to network with everyone and so he was very excited and very nervous about going to the meeting and at the meeting he was sitting next to a um, uh, a person that that did a crisis line and um, the, uh, the person in, in, in the crisis line started to tell him stories about the things that he'd experienced and they got into some very interesting stories and the chiropractor was about ready to get up and excuse himself and and the the, uh, the crisis worker said let me let me tell you about one story about a person that I took care of that was depressed and, and how I recognized that, that they were depressed and how I solved their, their issues. And, and it became a fascinating story. And it went on and on and on. And he suddenly realized everyone was leaving and, that, and, the, and the, the lunch was over and he hadn't networked with anyone. And he thought, what a wasted lunch. I, I'd been sitting with this fellow telling me about depression and how depressing it was to learn about this and, and not have a chance to network with anyone. So he, he went back to his practice and he was really bummed out because uh, he, he, he thought he'd wasted his day. Then he finished uh, you know seeing patients. The last patient he had was a fellow that had been working uh, uh, as a laborer, uh, was really uh, not really happy with his job and, and had hurt his back and, and he helped him a, a bit. And so he finished seeing him and, and uh, you know, it was a late night. He wanted to get back home because his dinner was waiting on the table and he was ready to close up shop after the fellow had left. And they just got this feeling that he needed to do something else. So he, he, he closed the door, went back into his office, turned the light on and sat there for a minute wondering what, what he was supposed to be doing. And then he decided to, uh, he, he felt like he had to call this last patient he had for some reason and see how he was doing. And so he called the, the individual and he said, well, I just felt I needed to call you. Now, he's never called a patient like this before. He, he never had an inkling or a premonition or a, 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 a desire to, to call a patient right after he'd seen him. And the fellow said, you know, I, I, I've been really thinking about uh, uh, how tough life is and and uh, you know thank you for thank you for calling me and I'll, I'll you know I'm, I'm I think I'll get better and, and so forth and so that conversation ended and uh, he went home and and you know thought about how bad his day was and and told his wife and and you know uh, a couple months later he uh, saw on the schedule the individual that had seen him that night that he had attended the, the luncheon and as soon as he walked into his uh, exam room, he broke out in tears. And my chiropractor friend thought, this is unusual. Why would he break out in tears? And he said, you know, when you called me that night, I was ready to commit suicide. I'd had everything mm -hmm. laid out on the table. I was ready to take uh, a bottle of pills. And <clears throat> I had to put the pills down as mm -hmm. I reached for the phone to talk with you. And your demeanor and your kindness and your uh, discussion with me uh, made me reconsider uh, what I was going to do. And I decided then that uh, maybe life was worthwhile. And I decided uh, after I talked with you to check myself into the, the psych unit and you you literally saved my life. And uh, suddenly uh, my chiropractor friend realized that a day that he thought was the worst day of his life may have been the best day of his life when he mm -hmm. saved, saved an individual's life who came to him very depressed. He intervened uh, using some of the same techniques that he had learned that day at the, at the luncheon. 
So what a coincidence that it was that he had happened to talk with a crisis worker and then faced exactly the same type of crisis and was able to talk this individual out of committing suicide, even though he didn't know that at the time, and mm -hmm. saved a life. Yeah. So. What a beautiful experience, yes. Mm -hmm. And and how often do we all walk down a path where we think something didn't turn out the way we wanted it to? But here we go, you know, this, this man saved a life. I mean, just incredible, incredible story. Yeah, there are times in everyone's life. You've reached the High Fashion Hotline. Hi, my husband and kids just gave me an executive order. Stylish new outfits now. Where do I go? Get to Old Navy. Old Navy? Yep, get up to 50% off store-wide during Old Navy's big President's Day sale. Up to 50% off store-wide? I won't veto that. Old Navy's fashion-forward jeans start at just 15 bucks for adults, 10 bucks for kids. And colorful fleece starts at just 15 bucks for adults, 12 bucks for kids at Old Navy and OldNavy.com. But hurry, the sale ends soon. Well, just call me Shopper-in-Chief. We're going to Old Navy now. High Fashion, Old Navy. Valid 212 through 220. Select styles only. I'm sure that we have days where we think we didn't do anything good, that we uh, just just uh, got through the day. And in retrospect, you may realize that that uh, you, you did something that was truly uh, amazing. Yes. I, I had an experience uh, once in the office. It was a strange experience. One of my patients was uh, had a bad cancer and was admitted to a different hospital, not the hospital I attend. And um, he called me up uh, while he was there and he said he was and, and this was a day like no other in my office it was a crazy day i was an hour behind there were patients all over the place uh, everyone was mad at me for being late and, and so, <laughs> of course and of course yes. so this, this person calls me up and he says doc i i i'm at this other hospital I, I know you know that and so forth and i did and he said i i need to know if i'm going to die or not yeah. And I thought, oh, I, you know, I, I wish I had more time. I didn't say that to him, but I'm thinking to myself, I wish I had more time to call his doctor and talk about it and so forth. But yeah, you make some time. And I, I, I called his, his oncologist and I said, you know, what's going on? What, what are his numbers? And he told me what his, what his kidney function was. He was in basically in renal failure. He was going to die in the next yeah. couple of days. And so... I called him. I called him back, and I said, "You know, I'm I'm sorry, John. Um, you know, and it was hard for me to do this mm -hmm. in the middle of uh, all this craziness happening around me. To really, uh, and it's hard to say to a person, you're going to die. And I had oh, to tell yeah. him directly, uh, you're you're going to die in the next couple of days. And I felt so bad about doing that. And it was, that was the icing on the cake for the horrible bad, bad day. Yeah, he did indeed die within the next couple of days. And a week later, I attended his funeral. And as I walked into the funeral home, the entire family came up to me and hugged me. And I thought, what did I do wow. to deserve this? And they said, thank you for telling John that he was going to die. Because when he found that out, he suddenly became at peace with himself. He called for the priest to get mm. left rights. Oh, how and wonderful. You, you made him so calm. He was so anxious before that because, because he didn't know what was happening to him. After you talked with him, he knew what was going on. The entire family was at peace with the situation. We said our mm -hmm. prayers. We said our goodbyes. It was the most beautiful thing that had ever happened to us, even though he oh, did die. Mm -hmm. It was a beautiful way to go, and you made it all possible. And so what turned out, what I thought was the, <laughs> the worst day of my life, turned out to be an incredible blessing for he and his family, unbeknownst to me. So I think mm -hmm. some days are like that, and, and I think we are... Uh, you know, called upon to do some things that we don't realize uh, until later on in retrospect what we've done. That's beautiful. That is. I mean, it, it, to, to us as patients, I mean, doesn't it make sense that we do want to know the truth? We do want to know what's happening. It doesn't help us to be kept in the dark. Right. And to be left wondering, which I think that's worse, you know. So thank God you were able, if, as hard as it was, like you said, to tell somebody that they're going to pass away, that yeah. you you gave him what what a gift you gave him, incredible. That was, that was a hard call, a really hard call to make. Oh. I wondered if I did any good or did any bad that day, and and it turns out that that was the, just the thing he needed. So oh, my think. goodness just knowing because many times people have something they'd like to do but they put it off because they think they've got tomorrow yes mm. and being able to finish mm -hmm. something or complete something or just say something that yes. makes a difference for the rest of our lives oh yep. yes True. yes exactly now do you have a favorite story in the book 
Oh, there are a couple of favorite stories, but I've got a kind of a, a strange one that's my favorite story. And, okay, uh, let's hear it. That's that's my Grandma O'Hanlon story. Um, Grandma O'Hanlon uh, was a grandmother for Dr. Heitzler's wife, Joan. And Dr. Heitzler delivered a couple of our kids, and they're still walking and talking, so uh, <laughs> he did a great job. Uh, they may be partially brain damaged, though, but uh, <laughs> like, like most And kids, they'll blame they you, are. of course. <laughs> yes. Uh, but uh, Joan well, became very, very close to her grandmother, Grandma O'Hanlon. Grandma O'Hanlon was a midwife who delivered lots of babies over her over her career and she was uh, an incredibly spiritual person she would work for free if a, if a family couldn't afford her and she'd stay with the family for a few weeks after the delivery to help out with the baby and so she was an incredible person and she eventually got old and had to retire from from uh, delivering babies and she then lived with Joan who was a little girl at the time and her mother and uh, Joan would say if I could make it to Grandma Hanlon's lap and I was in trouble with my mom I know I'd be safe <laughs> So Joan, Joan was delivering her fifth child. The, the Heitsters, I think, have eight children. This was her fifth child she was delivering, and the delivery went pretty well. <laughs> Dr. Heitzler was there because he's an obstetrician, but he refused to do the delivery. It was uh, his, his partner that did the delivery. And everything went well until after the delivery, there was some a minor complication. They had to do uh, some um, a minor procedure on their uterus, and Joan was in a great deal of pain, so she asked for some pain medication. And at the time, trialene was the drug to use. That's a drug administered by mask, and that puts a, a woman into a deep sleep. Mm -hmm. And then when they take the trialene off, they wake up. So they were about ready to put the trialene on Joan's uh, face when she uh, suddenly saw her, her grandmother, Grandma Hanlon, walk into the room, who stood at the head of the foot of the bed uh, with her typical polka dot dress and her uh, hair up in a bun and, and her old lady shoes and her white sweater <laughs> vest that she liked to wear. And she shook her head to, to Joan, don't, don't, use, don't take the trialene. And Joan didn't understand why, but she listened to her and pushed the trialene away. Well, no one realized that Joan had eaten a very large meal right before her delivery. And about a minute after she pushed the trialene away, she vomited the entire meal. <gasps> and she'd been unconscious. Oh, oh my With the word. mask on, she would have aspirated and it could have been very serious or, or life-threatening. Could have died. Yeah. Have died. My goodness. Mm -hmm. So Joan, Joan says she made it back to Grandma Hanlon's lap one last time, overcoming time and eternity because Grandma Hanlon had died 22 years before. Oh, oh my, my goodness. goodness. Isn't so, that something? That's that, one of my favorites. That, yes, I can see why. Yeah. Yes. Oh. Yes. How wonderful. Love, love overcoming all barriers there. Yes. So they were very close. Uh, That's and fabulous. She saw, her. she saw her saying no to the anesthesia. Yes. And yes. she knew this is not for me and pushed it away. Saved her yeah. life. Oh, it did. Incredible. It did. Amazing. Incredible. Yes. Yeah. Yes, we have so many of our people in the audience who, who want to know, you know, how, can I see somebody who's passed? Can I look forward to seeing a loved one, you know, the, in a dream or something? And here's proof. Here's a wonderful oh, yeah. story that it did happen, and yeah. it saved Joan's life. It's just incredible. There were a number of stories uh, that came out. And again, uh, I didn't s select these stories that for any particular cause. I, I just selected the ones that I thought were that touched me so much. But there were a number of stories that happened to come out uh, about people that had passed that had participated in, in our lives. And um, one of the ones that, that I like so much, my editor didn't love this one, but I love it. And I, I, I had to put it in the book. It's about, uh, uh, it's a dime story. And uh, Oh, uh, yes. Steve Graham is an ER doc that uh, told me the story, and he was seeing a person in the in the emergency department who um, had a, a abdominal complaint, and but he noticed on his on his arm was tattooed a dime, and he thought this is a little unusual, and you know he didn't want to be too prying, but he the, the, his curiosity got the best of him, and he said, you know, I, I noticed that dime on your arm. What 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 what's the purpose? What's the reason for that dime? He said, my son is a great coin collector, and and he loved to collect coins, and his favorite coin was a dime. And I think it, be, it was his favorite because every time he'd go to somewhere special, he'd find a dime. He'd go to a Cubs game in Chicago and he'd look, pull up the seat and there'd be a dime on the on the floor. Or he'd go to a, <laughs> oh, a nice restaurant oh, and he'd move the sakes. plate and there'd be a dime underneath the plate or something like that. And, and he mm -hmm. started to collect those dimes. And he said, tragically, my son a number of years ago was killed in the expressway. And, and oh. uh, ever since then, uh, I've been really sad and upset. 
but uh, I found dimes in, in special places. And now I'm finding these dimes all over the place. And they, they occur when there would be a special event that my son would, would, would love to be part of. Oh. And he said, uh, so I had this dime tattooed on my arm to let him know that I know that he's looking out for me and that he participates in my life. And I want him to, to, to I want to show him that I know that. And that's why I had this ta dime tattooed to my arm. And, and uh, Dr. Graham thought that was a nice story and he wished he could believe it. But, you know, it didn't, he didn't say anything derogatory, but he just couldn't quite believe the story like that. And so he finished seeing the individual and sent him on his way and, and then went back to the doctor's dictation room, which is only uh, open for doctors, and uh, was about ready to pull out the chair and sit down and, and dictate the note. And uh, there was something shining on the floor when he pulled the chair out. He looked down. <laughs> oh, my down, word. A dime. There it was. Yes. Amazing. And he, said, and he said to himself, you know, thank you, Robbie, for, uh, Robbie was the name of the boy, thank you, Robbie, for, for helping me believe. Uh, oh, how special. The that is it. great. The interesting addendum to that story is my wife, as I mentioned to you before, is always my editor, my initial editor, and she'd tell me if the story was good or not. And she read that story and said, this is a great story. I love this story. And she went into the next room after she put the story down and, and looked at the counter, which had been empty before, and guess what was on the counter? Oh, oh, oh my yeah. word. Oh, my goodness. Oh, oh how see? fabulous. Yeah, that was interesting. So Transcending time and space. Mm -hmm. What a beautiful message. That's a beautiful message. Yes. Ah, oh, well, I, this is incredible. I want to hear more stories. I read all the stories, but hearing you speak them, it just adds a whole other dimension. Oh, I hope you'll do um, an audio for of this book. So that people can also just listen to your voice as you tell these wonderful stories. We hope to do that. Yes, we yes. do eventually. So yes, oh, it would fabulous. Be great. Yes. Here's another question from the chat room. They want to know: Do you have a sense of what percentage of patients want to know if they are facing imminent demise? Is that something people generally want to know? Um, I think they do. I think most people, if they are really close to death, uh, want to know uh, that, that they are. Many patients don't want to know uh, how serious an illness is, however. So in many cases, uh, patients will, will kind of um, not want to know how serious their cancer is or how uh, that they have Alzheimer's disease and things like that. But I think most people that are very close to death uh, want to know that, that they are they are very close to death. I think that's mm -hmm. my experience, at least. Yeah. And unfinished business. To share. In case there's unfinished yes. business. Yeah, yes, yeah, I think that's exactly. the reason. I think they want to say goodbye to their friends. Mm -hmm. They want to tell people that they are, are grateful for what they've done throughout their life. And I think that that's mm -hmm. one of the uh, one of the things that they want to do. Make sure that they're they're uh, okay with their whatever they believe, uh, mm -hmm. whatever spirit they believe in, or God. They want to make their their peace with God. And I think that's uh, that's why they want to know if they're if death is imminent. Now, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, PK. I was just going to say I've noticed that different ones will talk about a person holding on family members are coming and i know my grandmother's case uh, my uncles were all over the country and she became very ill they were coming in and she waited until the last one came as soon as he came in she was gone we see that all the time. Uh, mm -hmm. That's that's very true. I think people can can muster a certain amount of adrenaline and 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 everything else to to hold on until they've said goodbye to uh, to their loved ones and mm -hmm. then they let themselves go. So I think, I think people people can to a certain extent uh, determine the the timing of their death. And I think uh, that's a uh, PK. That's a very, very common occurrence. That I'm I'm waiting to see my my uncle come back or my child or whatever mm -hmm. from a, a, a long distance, and then within hours or a day they they they're gone. And that's yeah. you see that all the time. So it's amazing and so grateful that they could make that connection. Yes. 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 It helps a lot. Now, have the doctors that you've spoken with, have, has anybody seen a spirit leave a body upon death? You know, I, I, I don't know. I don't, I've not witnessed that. I don't think any of the doctors have mentioned that to me. So uh, some people have, have, have said that, that they, uh, they, they see that. But none of the doctors mentioned that to me, and, and I have not witnessed mm -hmm. that myself. Mm -hmm. so. 
Yeah, it's a it's an interesting occurrence. I guess people have tried to measure the the weight of the spirit right. and things like that. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. Uh, certainly, uh, some of these physicians have seen other spirits. Right? They've seen other other entities mm-hmm. come into a room, or something indescribable happens. Does a room get colder, or do they feel something they just can't explain that there's a presence? Yeah, I, I uh, we've had a couple do- doctors that have seen visions of of spirits that have have gone or, or have been visited by a premonition or a, a feeling uh, uh, from the person that has just recently passed. Uh, th- there was nothing about a cold room or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, my uh, one doctor uh, uh, was very close to a um, uh, a missionary doctor, and the missionary doctor uh, always wanted to show her that uh, there was something into the afterlife that that you know when people die there is something that they go to and he said he would always uh, as, a, as the crowning example of his missionary life he would he would show her that and he happened to die uh, one day when she was on vacation and um, uh, when she uh, was was going into the um, uh, to the hospital one morning uh, he appeared to her in in a vision mm-hmm. and uh, uh, she said that his countenance was that of one that had satisfied uh, himself that he had he had done the crowning crowning thing of his of his whole career that oh. he had shown her that there is something after this life, life after death that's beautiful well Dr. Mm. Kobaba we cannot thank you enough for joining us this evening this evening has just gone way too fast yes it and has. Again, we want to urge everybody to purchase your wonderful book, Physicians' Untold Stories, Miraculous Experiences Doctors Are Hesitant to Share with Their Patients or Anyone. And if you have a story to share, then please reach out to Dr. Kolbaba. He wants to hear it. And we'll be back next week, everybody. We have Betty Andreasen, Luca, and her husband, Bob Luca. They have a new book out, Lifting the Veil. They're going to debut this on our show next week, everybody. So we'll be back. Until then, we'll see you on the Blue Highway. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. reach the high fashion hotline. Hi, my husband and kids just gave me an executive order. Stylish new outfits now. Where do I go? Get to Old Navy. Old Navy? Yep, get up to 50% off store-wide during Old Navy's big President's Day sale. Up to 50% off store-wide? I won't veto that. Old Navy's fashion forward jeans start at just 15 bucks for adults, 10 bucks for kids, and colorful fleece starts at just 15 bucks for adults, 12 bucks for kids at Old Navy and OldNavy.com. But hurry, the sale ends soon. Well, just call me shopper in chief. We're going to Old Navy now. High fashion, Old Navy. Valid 212 through 220. Select styles only.